He broke into the scene in the early 70s with his first hit, Room Full of Roses. But it wasn't until his honky-tonk installed a mechanical bull and Hollywood came calling that he became a household name. With 17 number one hits, restaurants, nightclubs, and a theater in Branson, Missouri, he has certainly proven his staying power. Hello, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up next on Interviews, our conversation with the founder of the urban cowboy craze, Mickey Gilly. First thing I've always wanted to know about you, did you ever ride the mechanical bull? Rode it real slow <laughs> to take pictures on strictly for um, publicity. Yeah. I never tried to ride it like those other guys rode it. How in the world did all of that come to be, Gillies? Well, the mechanical bull came about because my business partner, when I had a hit record back in 1974, he decided he needed something for Gillies, and I was leaving, going on a road with Conway and Loretta. So he decided he would put uh, the mechanical bull in the club. When I came in to play the club again, I thought it was a mistake. Uh, but it turned out to be a, a pleasant surprise because it caught on and everybody wanted to come to Gillies and ride the mechanical bull. All the, all the people working at the plants around the Pasadena area, they wanted to be a cowboy on the weekend. So, uh, you know, when they got off from work, they'd come out to Gillies and get on that mechanical bull. And actually, it, it was never meant to be in an a <clears throat> entertainment establishment. It was meant to be a rodeo training device, and that's exactly what it was. It was a rodeo training device, but I don't know whether you noticed or not, but a bull, you know, uh, he's like, he's hinged. He, he's, that's the reason why he's so hard to ride. But the mechanical bull was more like a bronco than anything else, but they called it the El Toro mechanical bull. But everybody enjoyed coming out and trying to ride it, and uh, depending on the operator is what made it feasible to stay on it. What made what happen? Was it the club made your career happen or your career made the club happen? I, I think that uh, me having the hit record, uh, Room Full of Roses, back in 1974, uh, started turning things around slowly. Everybody up until that point in time accused me of copying my cousin, Jerry Lewis. And um, all of a sudden, I had, this, uh, I had this number one song called Room Full of Roses. And I had learned the song from, uh, <clears throat> from my cousin, Jerry Lee, and uh, Reverend Swigert. We were all grew up together there in Fairdale, Louisiana. The only reason why I hadn't recorded it before then is because, I mean, I'd been recording, but nothing was happening with my career at all. But uh, the club gave me a chance to relax a little bit. We opened the club in 1971, and things began to make a slow turn. Yeah. Take me back to your childhood. Now, you had a cousin that you are saying, Jerry Lee, who was quite successful. At what point did you realize, hey, this is something I can do too? Well, I decided that after Jerry Lee hit with a whole lot of shaking going on, which was uh, back in the 50s, the middle 50s, Elvis had already hit. Jerry Lee came along. He went to Memphis and met with Sam Phillips and went to Sun Records. And next thing I knew, he had a song called Crazy Arms. And then he had a song called Whole Lot of Shaking Going On. And uh, <clears throat> when I seen that uh, Jerry Lee was doing quite well in the music industry, I was very excited about it. So I felt like at that time, I said, if he can do it, I can too. I didn't realize it was going to take me that many years to <laughs> make things happen for me because I yeah. started playing clubs and and everything was going on pretty good for a while. Then all of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, Room Full of Roses came along. After Gillies is what made things happen for me more than anything else because I began to relax. I got a local television show, started doing the TV show. And the next thing I knew, um, it, was, uh, it was a pleasant surprise to have a hit record on the charts. Now, if I remember the story correctly, you were touring around doing your own music at the time, and a partner came to you and said, hey, listen, we have this club. We want to make you the house band. Will you come in? And that's how Gillies came to be. Yeah, basically that's what happened. Now, I'd been playing down the road uh, from uh, where Gillies is located at, uh, and I'd been working there for, oh, I guess um, about nine years, I guess, in one spot. And when I left there, he came looking for me. He thought that I had a part of that club, that I own part of it, but I didn't. I was just a musician playing and singing. And so he came after me, and he said, I got this club down the street uh, from where you was working at, and that's where you need to be because <clears throat> that's where your crowd's at. And he talked me into coming over to uh, look at it. And when I first took a look at it, the first thing I told him was, I said, I need to tear it down. <laughs> I mean, it was really in deplorable shape. But uh, he said, oh, I can fix it. I can fix it. I can make it look, you know, how you want it done, you know. So I started giving him all these demands. And he said, if I do all that, you're gonna come, you, you come to work, you know. And I said, what's the deal? 
He started to tell me what he's going to do for me, you know. I said, well, uh, if you're going to give me a, a, a salary, I said, because I can't, I can't come over here and play for nothing. I've got to have a salary. And so he agreed to give me a salary. So I didn't think he was, he was going to do it. So, I mean, I just upped my price, you know. I, I doubled my, my price at that time. I was making 200 a week. And I said, I need 400 a week. Well, I never made that kind of money. I was in 71, you know. <laughs> he said, if I do that, you, you come to work. And I said, you got a deal. Next thing I knew, I, I saw him changing, the, changing everything around. He said, what do you want to call it? And I said, uh, I don't care what you call it, anything you want to. Call it Sin Den if you want to. He said, let's call it Gillies. I said, that's a great idea. I've never seen my name in lights. <laughs> that's how it came about. Yeah. Did you ever regret that decision in the early time? In the first few years when you had the club, did you ever think, I shouldn't be here. I don't want to be here. Well, doing the only this. thing that I regretted was the fact that I had, a, <clears throat> I had a hit song and I had a club. And I didn't want to let, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a one-hit wonder. And who knows, you know, how many hits you're going to have. Right. I, uh, <clears throat> I had that room full of roses. It was number one song. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't know whether it was, I was going to never have another one or not. So I, I was trying to hold on. I was trying to hold on to the club and do the music. And so I made an agreement with uh, the guy that built the club. I said, you know, I'll give you half of everything I do on the road if you stay in the club business together. And that's the reason why I was in there so long. Did it ever make it hard in the music industry to be taken seriously as opposed to them saying, he's a novelty act, he's a guy with a club that's trying to promote the club through his music? How did you make sure they realized you were serious about what you were doing? That wasn't the problem. The problem was Jerry Lee Lewis. Everybody compared me to copying my cousin Jerry. And I, I, every time that I'd go in somewhere, the first thing out of somebody's mouth was, uh, oh, you just, you, you know, what are you trying to do, a copy of your cousin Jerry Lee? All right. And after I had some hits, I started having fun with it. I said, I'm not trying to copy him. I'm trying to be exactly like him. <laughs> you know, I started having fun with it. I didn't care what they said then. But uh, um, that was the biggest obstacle I had was because Jerry Lee was very successful. And, uh, and, I, and of course, I, then I started having a lot of fun with it because I, I go in sometimes and I tell him, I said, you know, I, said, I think Jerry Lee Lewis is probably one of the greatest talents in our family, if not the greatest. And if you don't believe me, you can ask him and he'll tell you. <laughs> and if people that know Jerry Lee, they knew what, where I was coming from, you know. <laughs> and then I'll turn right around and I'll say something about Reverend Swagger. And I said, I'm proud of him. He made more money than me and Jerry Lee Lewis put together. And the best part of all of it, it was tax-free. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, J- Jimmy heard me say a couple things sometimes like that. And he said, I pay taxes. I said, yeah, you pay taxes on what you want your salary to be. <laughs> You don't pay taxes on everything that's coming that in. Comes in. Yeah. <laughs> what was life like on the road? Was that tough? In the beginning, it was very exciting. I had a great time because, I mean, yeah, I, I'd never had done it before, and it was uh, just a very exciting time in my life. I got to tour with Conway, and uh, uh, my first tour was with Conway Twitty. And for the first, oh, I guess about the first week, Big Joe Lewis had, used to play the bass for him and talk all the time when Conway wouldn't say anything. I walked up to him one day, and I said, I don't think Con- Conway likes me, Joe. And he says, yeah, he does, too. And he called me Gilliam, Gilligam or something like that. <laughs> and uh, I said, he never says anything to me. He said, I all he does is speak, you know, and then go, goes on about his business. He says, well, that's just Conway's attitude. And he's, cause Con- Next time it, uh, you see him sitting up there playing his guitar, go up and sit down and just talk to him. I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And I'm very outgoing, you know, so... I had this little thing I was going to try to do, and I went to him and, uh, one night when he was playing his guitar, and I walked up there and sat down in front of him. I said, Conway, you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? He put the guitar down, and we talked for about two hours. So after that, you know, I felt comfortable in being around him. Yeah. He, um, he went out one night and got to, um, for a while there, they had, they had me on tour with Conway and Loretta, Loretta Lynn. and Cal Smith. There's four of us. And uh, Cal Smith went out and uh, uh, and opened the show, and uh, Conway went out second because Conway and Loretta was going to close because they did duets, and uh, Conway went out and got three or four standing ovations, and now I'm up next, you know. Yeah. But of course they don't take an intermission. Conway walks off that stage and he said, walks by me and he says, I wouldn't give that spot to a dry cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> I said, geez. That was the kind of guy. After I got to know him, you know, we had, we had a good, great time together. As the hits started coming and your career started taking off, 
Did that make touring easier or harder for you? Well, I tell you, when I first went out on the road, uh, um, a little story that happened to me. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we was in Denver, and nobody knew who in, in the world Mickey Gilly was. You know, that, the only thing that they knew was that, that I had a song called "Room Full of Roses" on the charts, and it was number one, and, and it was getting a lot of airplay. So when I went out on the stage and I was opening the show up, I think, and I was, I think I, if I'm not mistaken, I think I was opening the show this night for Conway Twitty, and they called in my time to go on. They go out and give me a big, big build up, you know. And of course, you know, you can imagine five thousand people out there, and about eight of them go. <laughs> and I walked out, and I mean, you know, I'm saying, gee, you know, wow, man, this is something else, you know. And uh, I started into my routine, and I did the songs that I was going to do. I only had about 20 minutes. And uh, 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 then I, I hit her in her down the piano. If I sent a rose to you, the crowd went, yeah! And I went, <laughs> wow, what happened? <laughs> and all of a sudden, it dawned on me, you know. I didn't have the name that I needed in the, in the music industry to be successful. I needed a name right. so people would recognize, you know, not, not book me by a song, but book me because of who I am. And uh, uh, so that was one of the things that I really had to work on. But after Room Full of Roses, I had four number one songs in a row. I mean, three number one after Room Full of Roses. So I had four number one songs in a row. And so then people began to recognize me when I, when I walked in place or when I went somewhere. Yeah. Then all of this just goes insane with Urban Cowboy. Well, the Urban Cowboy went nuts on us. I mean, I, I never dreamed that it was going to be as big as it was. It was just unbelievable. Um, tell you a little story. We, we went to uh, Six Flags. It was in Dallas. And the first time I ever seen a bus get a standing ovation. <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, I could not believe it. We're sitting on the bus, and we drive in. Of course, they got these big stands up there. You know, the bus drives in. And everybody on the stands, they rise. And <laughs> you hear them going off, you know. And I said, Whoa. <laughs> But it was me and Johnny Lee, you know. We had these two songs that were uh, that were number one songs. He had "Looking for Love" and I had "Stand by Me." So it was uh, it was quite an ordeal, and it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. That was a very very exciting moment in my life. Now, as I understand it, Esquire magazine had written an article about your club and the whole movement that was happening around your club. They had an article about the Mechanical Bull. Ah. Yeah, the Mechanical Bull is what caused the whole thing. So that thing. really was the reason all this began. Yeah, because this was 19, uh, I think it was 1977 or 78. 78, I think. Aaron Latham came down from New York City <clears throat> to talk to uh, um, the people around the club because the Mechanical Bull was causing so much stir. It was something different, you know, that never had been done before. And like I said before earlier, it was a rodeo training device. It was never meant to be an uh, entertainment establishment. And uh, that's the first thing that I told Mr. Cryer. I said, you know, I said, people going to get hurt on that bull. We're going to get all kind of lawsuits. But, uh, I mean, look what it did for us, you know. But he came down. <clears throat> Tell you a little story about that, too. Um, Bob Claypool was a dear friend of mine. He's not with us anymore. But he used to write for the Houston Post when they were in business here in the Houston market, Pasadena. And he was, uh, um, he was in the club that night. And he had written a, a, a book called The Gilly Rats. And... People, you know, would buy the book, and they, they, they liked Claypool because he wrote good. And uh, he, was, he was in the, in the club, and this guy, Aaron Latham, came in and, of course, struck up a conversation with uh, Bob Claypool. Now, Aaron Latham is uh, uh, Leslie Stahl's husband. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, let's give you a little background. And so he came down to, to uh, write an article for Esquire for about the mechanical bull. So he met Bob Claypool. Bob, of course, introduced himself to being with the Houston Post. So they got to talking. And uh, he said, uh, Bob said, would you like to meet the guy that owns the club? And, of course, he was talking about Mr. Cryer. So he said, I'll introduce you to him. So all of a sudden, here comes Sherwood walking up, you know, because he used to stand there all the time. He looked at everything. He looked everything over at the club. And he was carrying some garbage out. And he always dressed in some overhaul type things, you know I mean? He never, never dressed to the part that he was a, you know, very wealthy man with his club and all the popularity he was getting on Gillies. He said, Sherwood, come over here and say hello to uh, uh, Aaron Latham. So Sherwood set the thing down. He walks over and he says, oh, this is the club owner. This is Mr. Cryer. And uh, he, they shook hands. And he said, I'll, I'll be back to talk to you all in a minute. And he went back and picked the garbage and went out. And the guy turned to Bob Claypool and he says, I didn't want to meet the janitor. I wanted to meet the owner of the club. <laughs> he said, you don't know this, but you just met him. <laughs> <laughs> that is the owner of the club. And at that point, you guys were already the world's largest nightclub? Well, we were listening to the Guinness Book of Records being the world's largest honky-tonk. That's amazing. Yeah. 
The only mistake they made, they put it, they said Houston instead of Pasadena, but uh, it, was, it was in the Guinness Book of Records. Yeah. So then they decide they're going to make a movie out of the article that that gentleman wrote about the mechanical The urban cowboy, that. yeah. And He's, that becomes a ballad, a ballad of the urban cowboy, and I'll tell you a little story about that, too, because I was very set aside when that thing came out. I mean, I was a little upset with it because every other word was boy meets girl, twang, twang. Boy falls in love with girl, twang, twang, you know. Boy sings a song for the girl, twang, twang, you know. And I said, they're making fun of country music. And country music was my life. I didn't like for anybody to make fun of what I was doing, you know, for a living. And I, and I wasn't too happy with it. But we're on our way out to California to do, uh, it was either Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, or Donna Short, one of those shows out there, it was a talk show. And I think it was Merv Griffin, but I, I might be mistaken. Don't hold, that, hold me to that. But anyway, we was going out to do one of the talk shows. Could have been Mike Douglas, I don't know. But anyway, I'm sitting there with Cryer, and he says, uh, now look, I know you don't like that article. I said, well, I just think he's making fun of country music, you know. I said, I didn't, say I didn't like it. I just, I just don't like the way he portrayed country, you know. He said, well, let me tell you something. He says, we might get a film out of that article. And I said, have you lost your ever-loving mind? <laughs> 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 Who would ever do a film on this thing here? This is ridiculous. And uh, he said, um, he said, no, he said, they're, they're, they're talking to John Travolta about doing a, a movie on this, this, this uh, article. And I thought about it a minute, and I said, no, wait a minute. You know, they might do that. He was just coming off a of Saturday Night Fever. And if you see what he did with the Urban Cowboy, all it was was a country night fever. Yeah. And it, it made sense. And I said, oh, okay. I said, I won't mention it. <laughs> did you have to strong arm anyone into actually doing it at your club? I mean, could they have done it in a soundstage? Could they have taken it and done it in Hollywood? But they ended up coming and shooting. Well, they were going to do it in Hollywood, and my PR firm, I say my PR firm, our PR firm is with the Gillies, and they still work for me, but I don't think they work for Mr. Cryer anymore. But anyway, they, uh, they were going to do the film in uh, Hollywood, and uh, the Brokaw company went to them and said, look, we don't want you to do that film in Hollywood. We want you to come down to Texas and do it where it actually happened at. He said, you want to make it as authentic as you possibly can? That's where you need to go. You know, use the people that were there and put John Travolta with them. And uh, so they agreed with him. So they came down and uh, they paid us a fee to use the club during the day. We opened the club at night. So it, it was a win-win all the way around. Yeah. When did you know that it was going to be as big as it was? At what point did it hit you? It hit me when they released the film and uh, the next... Uh, night, uh, I uh, <clears throat> I was driving down uh, uh, down Spencer and, and uh, got close to the club, and I could see these lines of people all the way out to the street trying to get in. Yeah. And I went, "Oh man, this is unbelievable." <laughs> but Jim Bridges, he's no longer with us either. You know, he was the director. He, he directed China Syndrome, and he, he directed that. And he told Cryer at the time, he said, "This club will never be the same after we do this film." Boy, was he ever right. Yeah, country music was never the same after that. Well, film you know, uh, the thing that I, I really appreciate about the film too, if you think about it, all these guys that are wearing cowboy hats now, where did he come from? The urban cowboy. I wasn't wearing a, a cowboy hat in the film because I mean I never wore a cowboy hat before. But when that film hit like it did, I went and got me a cowboy hat and put on. <laughs> so all these guys that you see now are wearing cowboy hats, and uh, I wasn't too happy, even though I was a, I was a Big Garth Brooks fan. I mean, I, I love what, what he, he was doing. Uh, but he didn't like the urban cowboy. He, what I understand, he, he was, wasn't happy with the way it was portrayed. But uh, it was a big thing in my life. And yeah, I thank John Travolta every night when I go to bed. Thanks for keeping my career alive, John. <laughs> <laughs> and not just alive. I mean, it just, you became known as country music. Well, it was, uh, uh, I was in the elevator one night uh, uh, in Nashville. I was at the uh, Roadway Inn of all places. And I'm going, uh, I'm going in the, down in the elevator, and we're going out to the lounge to get a, something to drink. I'm not going to tell you what I'm drinking, but I'm going to get a drink. And uh, uh, some guy was in the elevator, and he said, uh, I just want to thank you for what you've done for uh, uh, the Western wear. And I said, beg your pardon? He said, I just want to say thanks to you for what you've done for Western wear. And I said, well, you don't need to thank me. You need to go thank John Travolta. I didn't bring that on. I said, he's the one that wore all those jeans and everything else, the cowboy boots, you know. Uh, but he, he's the one that made it happen. It, it took somebody like him to make it come together. Anybody else played the part, I don't think it would have been near as successful. Yeah. 
It was amazing. And then the club, eventually, we lost the club. Well, the only reason why the club closed was because uh, uh, it started, uh, there was never any upkeep done to it. It was just, it just completely started deteriorating. And I begged him, I kept begging him to make some changes. Uh, he, he, he didn't like changes. He wanted everything to stay the same. But nothing stays the same. Never, ever. Was it harder for you when the club closed or when the club burned down? I, I was already out of it when the club went. Right. But I, I mean, I had emotionally, already, when, you, when you heard Well, I mean, it hurt me that it burnt because uh, there was no reason for it to, to ever close. It, you know, it was, it was such a big thing. and People wanted to go there. And uh, all, it had, all it took was just a little of uh, a, a management to make, make it work a little bit better than what it was working. But, uh, um, and, you know, we had... Many, many chances to, uh, uh, to expand it, different parts of the country, Gillies. Didn't want to do that either. And I think the bottom line, when, when you stop growing, you start to die. Yeah. Now you've gone on in Branson, Missouri now is kind of the place for you. Well, I went to Branson and I think uh, in 1988 or 89, when you're having so much fun, you can't keep up with it. But anyway... <laughs> It's been it's been God sent to me because I, I still enjoy playing music and I got a nice theater. I'm in Branson, and I have the uh, <clears throat> the restaurant right next door to the theater there in Branson. So uh, we do our shows and uh, have a comedian. We do skits on a stage, and uh, <clears throat> this year we're gonna start doing DVDs so that people can you know if they want a souvenir of the show they can have it. Yeah, how has country music changed from your point of view over the last ten years or so? Well, you know, the thing that I noticed the most was that uh, the people that have come, gotten so big in country music uh, have made the songs more country than what it was back when we were doing the Urban Cowboy. That's the only thing that I noticed. I noticed, too, that the, the people that write their own songs seem to uh, do better. Yeah. They write their own material. That was one of my faults in, 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 in the music industry. I wasn't a good writer. I, wasn't, I couldn't create I had no, no, no creativity as far as music was concerned as far as the songs. They'd bring me a song and I could sit at the piano and, uh, and put it in my, my liking and, you know, put a style to it of some sort. And even though a lot of people accused me, like I said, of copying Jerry Lee, it didn't bother me after I got hit, yeah. had some hits. Is country music on an upswing now? Do you think it's leveled out? Do you think it's changing? Seems to be bigger than ever. Uh, the way the uh, Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo out here is going, we've got some acts that coming in there that are just packing the, uh, you know, the, the stadium. I, I, it's unbelievable to me that uh, things are going like as good, well as they are in country music. Um, I often wonder, you know, how long, how long certain things can last, but they keep turning it. Now you got this, you know, the computer systems now that. Uh, you can do just about anything you want to. You can make a recording studio out of a little bitty hole in the wall. It's just unbelievable. When you look around and you see so many of your contemporaries aren't with us anymore, how does it make you feel? Scared. Scared? <laughs> what did I tell you a while ago? I feel like I'm on death row. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I tell you what, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, my father passed away at 84. And... Uh, if I can make it to 84, I feel like I'm uh, be very fortunate, you know. I can tell the difference now than when I used to, uh, uh, when I'd finish a show, I wanted to go, you know, sit in a lounge or something and have a few drinks. Don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. I give up smoking, give up drinking. Give up women. <laughs> Is the thrill still there when you walk out on the stage, though? Does that yeah. stay the same? I have a great time when I walk out to perform for the people. I, I feel like they come to hear me sing the songs that were hits. So I try to do as many of the hits as I possibly can. And I have two young ladies that sing with me, and we try to do... Uh, I had a hit with Charlie McLean called Paradise Tonight. I do that with one of the girls, Casey Bays. And, and I do uh, uh, Candyman with, um, uh, with the other lady. Uh, just trying to think of... Uh, um, oh, Katie Lynn. I do some songs with her, too. I, I'm not really sure if... Uh, but... This year, we're going we're gonna to try to change the show up around, show, turn it around a little bit and do some different things. Yeah. 
do you though still get the same thrill as you got when you were 30 and walked out on the stage or 40 and you walked out there? Is it, does that remain the same? Well, it's better for me now because I feel like that I have learned so much about performing. I walk out now with more confidence. Back, back when I played uh, the theater that uh, your family owned, I scared to death probably when I walked out there. <laughs> <laughs> Still now shaking. Scared. Now not only are you walking on the stage, you own the stage you're walking out on. <laughs> How about retiring? Ever? Uh, I don't know about retiring. I, I keep thinking about it. They keep asking me when I'm going to retire, and I said, as long as I can walk, as long as my health holds up, I hope I can keep performing because I enjoy doing what I do. It's the only thing that I know. You know, I sit at the piano and sing, uh, you know, uh, Don't the Girls Get Pretty Close in Time? Well, that's all that matters to me. You Don't Know Me, or one of those songs that was a hit for me. And the people, you know, they keep saying. When you're home um, alone, do you play the piano and no. sing? No? If I'd practice, I'd be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mickey Gilly, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us today. Thank you. Truly a pleasure. pleasure. Mickey Gilly. To order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.